Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Sonambulations, New Directions in Interdisciplinary Approaches to Sleep. This graduate colloquium is the initiative of a research creation project called The Sociability of Sleep. My name is Elena Thane. I'm director of the Moving Image Research Lab at McGill University and uh, the collective for research on epistemologies of embodied risk. And I'm co-director of Sociability of Sleep along with my colleague, Alexandra Kaminska at the University of Montreal. We're really happy to have you with us here today. Just to note that this entire day will be recorded. Please feel free to leave your camera off. And um, I'm now gonna invite Alex to begin with our land acknowledgement. Uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, I'm Alex Kaminska. I'm a co-director of Sociability of Sleep. And I also co-direct the Artifact Lab in Media Studies and Rico Lab, uh, a space for research creation and making at the University of Montreal. The, the Sociability of Sleep project is specifically located in Tijake, Montreal and is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kanyinkahaka. Recognized with gratitude that they are the traditional custodians of lands and with waters in which we meet, live and rest. Jage has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among many First Nations, including the, the Kanyinkahaka of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Huron Wandat, Abenaki and Anishinaabe peoples. I would also like to share an acknowledgement developed by the Feminist Media Studio at Concordia for pandemic forms of assembly. While Zoom, a company that has exploded in value during the pandemic is a technical custodian of the platform on which we gather, this makes us, us no less occupants of the multiple territories on which we are all physically located. Zoom's headquarters are located on Mubekma Alwan territory. The Alwan have historically understood about sustainability, about communal societies, about giving gifts to those who pass by, and about sharing space. Their horizontal organization might inspire different emergent models of peer-to-peer -peer networking with the pandemic than we're enacting here in Zoom. We see Zoom as a platform which connects us and which alienates us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Sociability of Sleep project is supported by funding from the Government of Canada's New Frontiers and Research Fund. On our website, you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about upcoming events. Uh, like our sleep salon, um, performing sleep on February uh, 2nd, um, and all the events that happen will happen after that. And finally, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Alana? So thank you to everybody for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I'd especially like to thank Joshua District for his work putting this event together. Uh, I'd like to thank Charlene Henri, Project RA, and Randy Vergara, the postdoc on sociability of sleep, for their help as well and Patil Chilingurian for the beautiful project poster. We have four panels and a closing performance with a lunch break in the middle of the day. We're keenly aware that Zoom is not the friendliest medium, so please feel free to leave your cameras off except when you're asking questions and to take breaks throughout the day. Please also feel free to use the chat to share thoughts, comments, and relevant links. Um, after the speakers in each panel, there'll be a q and I'll turn it over now to Alex to introduce our first panel. We'll start the day with uh, the topic of sleeping soundly. The presenters are Devin Bate, a master's student in media studies at Concordia, followed by Josh Dietrich, who's currently teaching courses in communications, cultural studies, and sound and media at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And for full bios, you can look into the chat for links um, all, all throughout the day. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my decidedly night themed presentation first thing in the morning. I really appreciate you being here. And to all of the future viewers, uh, asynchronous viewers and beyond. So I will begin with a clip of audio to start us off. So they realize, oh, they're using the long, wrong size staff. Uh, so then Indiana Jones goes down. Yeah. Um, is this what happens? Uh, yeah, I guess he goes down there and uh, again, he has to deal with some things that he doesn't necessarily like. He has to overcome that. Uh, then he finds the, uh, huh, maybe, I may be doing this out of order, but that's pretty typical. But he goes down, he says, well, let me get this thing free. So that is a clip from the podcast called Sleep With Me. It's taken towards the end of an episode, which is designed ideally never to be heard. The recurring joke in reviews of Sleep With Me is that it is many listeners' favorite podcasts that they've never heard. 
Reviewers love to claim that they can't stay awake past the introduction, despite various reasons for chronic insomnia. I've been researching these kind of quietly popular media genres, like the sleep podcast, uh, that are proliferating in sleep spaces, and what it means for technological culture and the so-called attention economy. I'll start by giving some context of the role of audio in the current media landscape, as well as some innovations in how this media is, as is circulated. My interest in this topic is in part coming from my work as a designer. Uh, for the last decade, I've been in the business of designing sound for a diversity of contexts, like the theater or fitness classes, cinema, music just for itself. Regardless of whether or not it's sound design for something or sound just for its own sake, good design imagines or anticipates the locus of perception. So it does its job well when temporal, spatial, and affective context of the listener is addressed and baked into the production. Whether that listener is a ticket paying audience member in a theater or an aspiring sleeper in the making, a sound sticks when it interfaces with the realities of the listening body. Of course, in the landscape of streaming media, channels of dissemination seem endless and points of consumption difficult to track. So today, the curatorial component to design involves many actors and has evolved in conversation with media technology. The labor of curation at one time had a significant shift with the iPod as audio media was able to be consolidated, mobilized, and curated by the individual. Now, platforms like Spotify are in the process of shifting the point of curation again out of the hands of both consumers and producers via rapidly evolving machine learning. Spotify has been improving its ability to curate an ideal soundtrack in theory with minimal user engagement. In theory, Spotify can afford seamless 24 seven listening in the everyday theater from waking up with the news, working out, dating, gaming, and sleeping and even being able to read or anticipate your mood during those activities via meticulous real-time algorithmic profiling. And lastly on Spotify, the Spotify Connect feature allows this personalized stream to seamlessly transfer from one device to another. So your Google Home in the morning to transferring to your car during the commute, uh, to your AirPods during work, and maybe to your smart fridge for dinner. I'm highlighting the particular affordances of Spotify as it has unique implications within the so-called attention economy and how we sleep within it. I'm defining the attention economy from the perspectives of those actively getting their hands dirty with its logics, both in exploiting and critiquing it. On the one hand, from economists and market researchers like Karen Nelson Field and the Ehrenberg Bass, Bass Institute for Marketing Science, and the other, uh, cultural critics and Silicon Valley expats like the Center for Humane Technology. Perhaps instead of Spotify, a more intuitive point of entry for talking about attention economy might be TikTok's more brutally attention sucking uh, algorithm or doom scrolling Facebook or Twitter. However, an audio first platform like Spotify holds the distinct, distinct affordance of easier multitasking as opposed to task switching which is a considerable distinction as far as media engagement is concerned. So the details vary among researchers, um, but the difference between task switching and multitasking is thought of as a matter of time resolution or the time it takes to focus on one task to the next. So moving from YouTube to email, for example, would like, uh, likely be a case of task switching in the amount of time it takes to focus on one and then the other. With sound, the window of time between focusing on music and focusing on Gmail, for example, is small enough to be perceived as simultaneous. The theoretical ability to layer audio among other activities or even other media platforms affords an almost AR-like engagement with Spotify, which could theoretically maximize 24-7 engagement and ubiquity, which is a sort of fundamental aim of attention economy logics. And indeed, a 2021 Deloitte survey of digital media trends in the US uh, indicates that Gen Z 
uh, are principally playing video games, uh, followed second by audio streaming, surpassing even social media, TV, video, and scrolling the internet. This trend among the next generation of media users can shed some light on the recent audio turn that happened almost simultaneously across major platforms last year. Within a year of one another, Facebook, Reddit, and Twitter all released their own version of the audio-based Clubhouse platform, in which users can freely listen in on and contribute to audio group chats around particular topics or themes. And then in April of 2021, preceding the Metaverse reveal, uh, Facebook announced their new focus on audio products, including sound bites, which are like the Instagram, uh, the audio version of an Instagram reel. Uh, podcasts and the implementation of live audio throughout the platform. So all's to say, audio is a, a recent frontier in attention capitalism in that it ostensibly doubles the opportunity for engagement and advertising. There are only so many hours in the day for attention extraction, but this purported an increased ability to multitask, particularly with audio, doubles the size of the market. The highly personalized algorithmic curation of audio, coupled with the dynamics of the attention economy, is transforming the uses for sound design and the venues in which sound design comes to be expected. So these innovations nuance the question re-articulated by media scholars and cultural critics like Henri Lefebvre and rhythm analysis and John Crary 24-7 uh, as as the media day encroaches into the night and the media expands its modalities with our attention, when and how do we unplug to sleep? Uh, if you'll forgive the somewhat hyperbolized image in the name of theater. As being tethered becomes deeper habit, when do we turn our attention away from personally tailored media, letting go the hand of these loyal and non-judgmental affective chaperones to wander untethered and alone into the deep dark night? It is at this tension occurring within the night of the attention economy where I've set my research at the outermost liminal space between attention and inattention. Um, as Josh Dietrich has researched and may be speaking about in the next presentation, I'm not sure and I look forward to finding out, uh, sleep media, media takes on countless forms and works in many ways. For example, in Mac Haygood's book, Hush, Media and Sonic Self-Control, he studies the history of the white noise machine, a distilled form of what he calls Orphic media, a form of media that doesn't communicate information so much as it affectively remediates one's environment. Orphic media is a useful concept for my research, particularly in how it contrasts with my work. So to give some quick background, uh, white noise is a type of sound where every frequency is being played. Uh, Natalie, I think your microphone is on. Um, uh, white noise is a type of sound where every frequency is being played at the same time, uh, making it an effective tool at acoustically masking other sounds. So your brain's acoustic processing has something called a noise floor. Sounds below this threshold are more difficult to hear and unlikely to trigger active listening. This is why when your power goes out, for example, and the constant electric hums and buzzes that make up your acoustic wallpaper go quiet, this noise floor gives out, drawing your ear to the creaks of your apartment or your neighbors speaking that would otherwise be masked. What mechanically produced white noise does, in theory, is raise this noise floor so more sounds will get filtered by your brain's inattention. As Haygood discusses, white noise is media insofar as it mediates, but is empty of content, functioning at the level of psychoacoustics. Now, for the purposes of my research, uh, working at the intersection of attention economy logics, design, and technological culture, I'm interested in media that still has content, unlike the white noise machine, but similarly functions underneath this psychological noise floor in the realm of our inattention. So coded information with semantic meaning, but with primarily affective intent. As a designer, I've sought out forms of media that fulfill these categories and, explicit, and are explicitly designed to do so. Uh, there's no shortage of streaming media that have met their unlikely fate on beds and nightstands, sedating listeners with niche interests. 
Uh, indeed, it seems that if you can sleep to it, there may be a sleep media of it. Uh, the sleep podcast is a good example of this design paradox. The better the design, the more it encourages disengagement. A narrator uses spoken word to try and lull you to sleep, simultaneously sedating the user while pushing the limits of how long we can pay attention within the media day. For example, in the Sleep With Me podcast, uh, the narrator tells a story, but rambles, gets sidetracked, and rarely finishes a sentence resembling the peripatetic way your dreams might resemble. Uh, while the podcast Nothing Much Happens, Bedtime Stories for Grown-Ups, a banal story is narrated and then repeated verbatim more slowly and quietly. The mechanics of the sleep podcast, regardless of their iteration, play a delicate balancing act between attention and inattention, providing just enough engagement to be an effective and psychological chaperone into the night, but enough, but empty enough that you won't really notice when you stop listening altogether and fall asleep, perhaps catching a mid-story advertisement on your way out. The sleep timer on Spotify's front user interface was fortuitously added the year after podcasts were incorporated into the platform, which was considered of the most significant updates to the Spotify business platform and therefore the audio media landscape in general. There isn't necessarily a causal relationship between these two things, but the foregrounding of the sleep mode would indicate the materialization of a common listening practice and a principal innovation in how users are encouraged to listen to podcasts. And subsequently, just this year, New York Times published an article claiming that, quote, the adult bedtime story industry is booming, citing that amongst the various uh, services that meditation apps provide, the spoken voice for sleeping is of the most popular. Bedroom producers and celebrities alike have begun to stake their share in the bedtime story market. The current zeitgeist of bedtime stories aside, uh, I've been focusing in on the podcast Sleep With Me that we heard at the beginning, uh, which seems to have had the longest and most documented success of this niche type of media. Drew Ackerman, the producer and narrator, has been releasing two episodes a week since 2013, currently totaling over a thousand episodes. And for at least the last seven years, it has held a consistent place in the Apple podcast and now Spotify podcast charts. To begin to wrap this up, um, I'm highlighting the recent proliferation and popularity of the genre to ask what endemic harms are sleep podcasts used to mitigate? The popularity of the genre acts as an index for a particular type of insomnia and one popular way to solve it. I'm drawing on Dylan Mulvin's term, media prophylaxis, as an analytical frame. In Mulvin's words, media prophylaxis is an analytic concept for describing and analyzing the arrangement and orientation of bodies and technologies according to the avoidance, prevention, and mitigation of harm from the form or content of media. The Sleep Podcast is a form of media that aims to paradoxically mitigate the dynamics of daily media practices, trading the eyes for the ears. Though I suspect it's mostly listened to privately, uh, this service is social on a few levels. Uh, first in that the core ingredient is the human voice. Unlike the conventional podcast, which is defined by speech, the sleep genre foregrounds the human voice over speech presence over meaning, and an insistence to remain tethered, not for information, but for company. I propose that the popularity of the genre might indicate the social dimension of this private sleep ritual, and therefore the social dimension of an endemic genre of insomnia it aims to mitigate. I'm picturing solo sleepers with their phones chatting away beside them, perhaps sharing the faint notion of an imagined listening community, akin to falling asleep to familiar voices on the radio. Drew, Drew Ackerman's familiar introduction to Sleep With Me takes 20 minutes of charming rambling, never the same way twice, but always hitting the same predictable markers that many listeners claim to never make it past. And then around the 23 minute mark, Drew interrupts himself to plug an ad for sleep headphones curated around the time of hypnagogic sleep on the precipice of going under. 
he mentions justifiably how this makes his dedicated service financially sustainable. Once we're ready to drift off, Drew carries on and we won't notice when the Spotify timer runs out and turns off. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Devin. Um, we're gonna we're going to uh, um, keep keep the questions for afterwards. There's a couple for you in the, in the chat if you want to look at that in the meantime. And uh, we'll move over to Josh. Hi. Good morning. Uh, can you can everyone hear me? All right. Um, uh, thank you, Devin. That was that's a really great paper, really interesting. So many interesting formulations um, that I'm still working through, um, but I think there is gonna be a lot of good overlap um, as, as I knew there would be. Uh, so, um, and it's, it's great to be here. Man, I'm so glad I didn't have to go to Montreal, minus 14 here in Toronto, minus 15. Okay. Um, and if you don't know Celsius out there, um, then that's probably, it's colder here than where you are. Okay. Um, so uh, I had never understood the title of Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Probably because I only came to the novel by way of Ridley Scott's 1982 film, film adaptation, Blade Runner. If the whole ambiguity of that story is whether or not androids are like humans insofar as they have feelings and memories and free will, then shouldn't the title of the novel have been, do androids count electric sheep? As in, don't androids do all the same things we do, like have anxious sleepless nights and count sheep as a kind of folksy mental exercise to calm the mind and fall asleep? When I finally sat down and read the novel and realized what a gutting satire it is, having very little in common aesthetically with the overwrought futurism of Scott's film, I came closer to understanding the title. Dick's novel depicts a post-World War planet that can no longer sustain most forms of animal life, including human and sheep. Most of Earth's uh, human population has migrated to space colonies where they are served by android slaves, uh, but the few humans that have remained on the toxically radioactive planet compete with each other by buying expensive animatronic animals as status symbols and nostalgic tokens of the past. Dick's uh, satire, embedded in the title, suggests that even when the world ends, a certain North American middle-class consumerism will live on, and that even the robot slaves of a dying species will not dream of their own emancipation but will dream the dreams of buying expensive consumer electronics like electric sheep, uh, dreams that were programmed into them by their human designers. In any case, that slippage for me between the wrong title, do, do androids count electric sheep and do androids dream of electric sheep created a sort of indelible nexus in my mind between dreaming, falling asleep and consumerism. Years later doing graduate work, I read Jonathan Crary's 24 seven, uh, which Devin mentioned, um, which puts its finger or maybe it's sledgehammer right on the intersection of dreams, sleep and consumption. As much as I was and continue to be inspired by that book, especially by the grim finality of its critical position, I wondered how it might be possible uh, to bring the tools of, of my disciplines, cultural studies and sound studies with a new materialist or eco-materialist theoretical orientation to the study of sleep and to think about what a new materialism of sleep might be without of course forgetting the old, if still very much up-to-date materialism of sleep's ongoing commodification. So this is just some background context to my interdisciplinary approach to sleep. And now I'm gonna to shift to a more specific argument or maybe sequence of hypotheses about how to think sleep and sound together. Setting to one side the complexity of sleep, how to study it, what it means socially, how it is experienced individually and collectively, and many of the other important questions being taken up by the sociability of sleep project, uh, we can juxtapose the rather cumbersome but precise uh, definition of sleep that emerges in uh, Kenton Croker's The Sleep of Others. 
Kendon Croker was, was at Sleep Salon number two last, last uh, term. Uh, Croker, or Kenton, uh, recounts, recounts the origins of the modern scientific definition of sleep as the phased alteration of brain waves recorded by an encephalograph, or EEG, hooked up to a sleeping body overnight in a sleep laboratory. The background hum of the brain, which the EEG measures via electrodes attached to the scalp, uh, changes significantly from waking to sleeping, and then within sleeping itself, demonstrates a more or less regular progression through stages of different rhythms, to which correspond the other neurological, hormonal, and me metabolic side effects of sleep, like dreams, lowered body temperature, secretion of melatonin, etc. Um, but regardless of what your eyeballs or your pineal gland or your repressed unconscious desires are up to, uh, you're only sleeping scientifically when an EEG can record the fact that you're sleeping. Borrowing freely now from uh, Jonathan Stern's canonical work in, in sound studies from the audible past, um, work on history of sound recording and transduction and the tympanic or eardrum function, um, this modern scientific definition of sleep sounds a lot like a sound. Stern traces the history of a 19th century uh, device called the phonautograph, which was essentially an excised human inner ear, gross, uh, hooked up to a small glass plate, uh, a smoked glass plate that would etch sound waves onto the plate when the tympanum, uh, when the eardrum was vibrated. With Stern and other historians of sound media like Patrick Feaster, we see that ontological assumptions about what sound might be in this case, compressions of air that vibrate a membrane in the ear and produce a sensation in the brain, uh, inform the development of scientific tools that both measure and enact those assumptions to create a kind of assemblage of technology and human physiology that produces what sound is. Sleep then, as a recording that is produced in a laboratory by a body coupled with a machine and attended to by technicians is not just analogous to sound, but is sound. Moreover, the EEG records graphical waves on rolls of paper in the old days on, on computer now. And graphical waves have been the predominant visualization of sound since the 19th century, maybe earlier, um, extending even to sound frequencies that we can't hear, but which are still potentially sonic like earthquake or seismic vibrations or color frequencies of light. So if sleep is a cerebral sound, then how can we listen to it? Or how else can we listen to it beyond the technical listening as recording of the EEG in the sleep lab? How might it be possible to think of the embodied experience of sleeping as listening, listening to the cerebral sound that is sleep? From a phenomenological perspective, these are difficult questions because it remains unclear how phenomenology can conceive of a non-conscious experience. Bracketing a whole literature that is certainly more complex than, than I can do justice to here, uh, let me quote Jean-Luc Nancy from The Fall of Sleep, quote, there is no phenomenology of sleep, end quote. Page 24, English translation, check it out. But I wanna suggest here uh, that um, recent work in media studies around cognition can help get us around this seeming theoretical or methodological dead end. Catherine Hale's concept of non-conscious cognition developed in her book, Unthought and Elsewhere, uh, describes a notion of cognition that is distributed across an ensemble of conscious and non-conscious processes that are underway not just in the brain but across the entire nervous system. The brain and the body are constantly taking in and processing information, making all kinds of decisions about that information, and only debriefing consciousness on a strict and I suppose literal need-to-know basis. Uh, this conscious, this non-conscious cognitive infrastructure 
of consciousness then allows Hales to expand the reach of the term cognition to include the activities of plants, microbes, and machines. This may be old news to the cognitive and neuroscientists in the, in the audience today, but it might come as a rather abrupt paradigm shift to humanist scholars who have historically tended to privilege consciousness and imagine the brain as its singular seat. Hales does not, to my knowledge, write about sleep, but her work does invite that connection. Uh, if phenomenology runs aground as a method for apprehending sleep as experience, and yes, that's, that's a big if, uh, perhaps a kind of media studies approach to sleep as cognition can help us conceptualize how we embody and live sleep and listen to sleep. And here, I, I just want to make a reference to one of the sleep salons from the fall where we, we heard talks from Antonio Zadra and Elisaveta Solomonova on dreams. Their, their laboratory-based uh, research on dreaming moves, I think, in this kind of cognitive direction um, where dreams represent a kind of cognition by other means, uh, showing how the sleeping brain and body are still fully invested in all the information and emotions and problems of waking life, only working on them via alternative cognitive pathways. Um, in any case, thinking about sleep as cognition, sleep as embodied experience, sleep as listening, finally brings me to the phenomenon of beats, uh, that is beat frequencies uh, and binaural beats. A beat frequency is a kind of interference generated by the co-presence of two sound waves vibrating at slightly different frequencies. If one wave is vibrating at, say, 440 hertz, concert A, and the other at 430 hertz, a little flat, it's probably, probably the violas. Anyway, um, you will hear a beat of 10 hertz. I, I love violas. It's a, it's a beautiful instrument. Um, so you'll hear a beat of 10 hertz, which is the difference between those two frequencies. Um, I say here. Uh, but the hearing of beats is complicated because they are infrasonic. Uh, that is below the threshold of human hearing. Uh, and they can't be heard as a tone, but more like a pulse or a tremor or a warble within the audible dissonance of the two frequencies that produce it. Hearing, beach, hearing beats usually also requires some musical training since the only people who, who consciously listen for beats are guitar and bass players tuning their instruments with harmonics, in which case they listen to beats in order to eliminate them, or piano tuners who listen to beats in order to count them in precise ratios uh, to preserve the weird kind of out of tuneness that is like tempered tuning on keyboard instruments, which is, that's a whole other thing there. But anyway, um, in 1973, a biophysicist named Gerald Oster published an essay called Auditory Beats in the Brain, in which he described a particular phenomenon called binaural beats. In his experimental research, Hoster played dissonant tones in binaural headphones, so headphones that can kind of completely isolate one signal or sound per ear, uh, played uh, dissonant tones for his test subjects, say a tone at 440 hertz in the right ear, 430 hertz in the left ear, and found that they could hear the beats in their heads. What's interesting about this scenario is that the beats do not arise from the interference of two sound waves interacting in a shared acoustic space, um, like the, those two guitar strings that you're tuning, those piano strings that you're tuning. Um, the beats are generated by and in the brain itself. Oster didn't discover this phenomenon, which like most interesting, interesting things in history was observed by a German researcher in the 19th century. But he did discover a further interesting property of binaural beats. His subjects would detect binaural beats even when one of the beat generating tones was presented at a volume below the audible threshold or was acoustically masked, like kind of covered up um, by other non beat generating tones. As Oster puts it, quote, evidently the brain is able to detect and process the signals even though one of them is too weak to impinge on consciousness. So Oster demonstrated that in addition to 
hallucinating beats by conjoining two independent sound waves, the brain is capable of sustaining that hallucination even when the sounds that trigger it are not audible. To be, to be clear, in this scenario, there is no actual interference of sounds generating a beat frequency, nor is any aspect of the audio equipment producing an infrasonic sound that could be heard as a beat. The brain and auditory system alone provide that vibration or presuppose it and thus hear it. The seeming paradox that the brain hears sounds that are not actually there or that a listener can listen to the neurophysiological byproducts of the very process of hearing is in a way a, a proof of non-conscious yet cognitive listening. The infrastructure of hearing allows us to experience sounds as beats that are technically and physiologically inaudible, as well as listen to sounds that do not exist. Sound constantly converts itself from the material to the imaginary, even hallucinatory, at the frontier between conscious and non-conscious listening. Coming back to sleep, this phenomenon of beats as a processing artifact of a cognitive system sounds like a dream. If you think of a dream as a somno neuro architectural situation that produces a non-conscious experience, which is how I, the, 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 the kind of a definition of a dream that I was getting from, from Antonio and Elisabetta's talk. And I want to suggest as one conclusion of my talk today that there is, there is some nuanced theoretical or methodological work that remains to be done in exploring these liminal moments between consciousness and non-consciousness in sleep, in perception, in cognition, finding the processual and physiological infrastructures that support both those mental and bodily states. Sleep may well inaugurate, or maybe it already has inaugurated, a new paradigm in, in humanities research on media and the senses in ways analogous to what the eardrum was for the history of sound, at least for a scholar like Jonathan Stern, uh, a little bit of bodily life that can completely reorganize the technical and epistemological ways we know, experience, and archive the world. But I would be skipping a beat if I didn't return to the old materialism of sleep, dreams, and consumerism, a beat that I can still hear in between those two titles of Philip K. Dick's novel that are not quite in tune with each other. I first learned about the technical basis of binaural beats and Oster's research in an essay called Music for Sleeping by Anahid Kasabian. She mentions binaural beats in their guise as a sonic sleep aid in her critical discussion of the marketing of sleep apps, noise machines, and commercially produced music designed as background music for sleeping. Um, this, this essay, Devin, is from a few years ago. I think you're way more up to date. Um, but uh, um, in any case, if you, if you Google binaural beats right now, your first hits will not be Gerald Oster. They will probably be YouTube videos for sleeping or guided meditation, videos with hundreds of millions of views, videos of soothing electronic and or nature sounds, interrupted occasionally by commercials of bearded white guys in tank tops saying things like, what if I told you I had a tried and true method for landing a TEDx talk in the next 30 days, et cetera. Uh, because binaural beats are and have been since the reception of Oster's article by a host of pseudo experts and media entrepreneurs, a fad of a kind of new agey quasi therapeutic discourse around meditation, optimized concentration, enhanced memory and learning abilities and improved sleep. The idea goes back to the sonic definition of sleep. If sleep is defined as an oscillation of brain waves at a particular frequency, say 2.5 hertz for delta or dreamless sleep, uh, four hertz for REM sleep, then summoning beats at those frequencies in the brain through binaural headphones should literally tune the brain to sleep or to other desired frequencies for meditation, just like you tune those guitar strings or those piano strings. There is today little clinical evidence of binaural beats efficacy in inducing and maintaining sleep. So in this regard, beats are unlike say, 
melatonin supplements or controlled light exposure, which as, as chronobiologist Deborah Skeen, who talked at the salon a couple of weeks ago, demonstrated uh, these are elements of the neurophysiology of sleep that can also be used therapeutically to regulate sleep in the case of shift workers or people with circadian sleep disorders. Binaural beats for sleep then have proven success successful commercially, if not clinically, which opens up the way for another discussion of sleep and sound altogether, the daily practices and habits of listeners who remediate their sleep environments with particular kinds of sounds, uh, music, and audio technologies, and podcasts. This is exactly what Devin, uh, where Devin is. Um, uh, there is a material congruence of sleep and sound that is not just a theoretical question about cognition, consciousness, and epistemology. That congruence is also practiced and woven into the daily nightly rhythms of millions of sleepers slash listeners, which constitutes another crucial lived aspect of the social and sonic materialism of sheep. Sorry, sleep. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Josh. That was uh, great. I took so many notes uh, as I did for Devin. So thank you for both for starting us off on such uh, uh, a good uh, note. Um, I have uh, questions that I will leave aside uh, and defer to the audience first. So uh, does the audience have questions? Uh, if you want to raise your hand or if you prefer, you can write it in the chat. Um, I'm happy to read it for you. There's a question from Victoria that now I think was for Devin and maybe I can just ask, just go through that since I was, as you think of other, uh, other questions. I think Victoria, you were asking about um, whether basically whether the there is a rise in popularity of these uh, podcasts and um, um, during the pandemic, or if you know if it's become more popular than before during this time. Probably, probably, yeah. I I mean I consider that for sure. I I first noticed the um well sleep podcasts in general, but also uh, writing about sleep podcasts a couple of years before the pandemic. Um, so definitely at least the sleep with me podcast was popular prior to then, um, in terms of this whole like audio turn amongst platforms and, uh, a proliferation of writing about sleep podcasts, um, that has happened since the, the pandemic. So it, there is likely a correlation, but, um, I, I haven't, I haven't thought about that or I haven't researched that, uh, more deeply. Um, just, and I feel like that's a, that's a whole other dimension to, um, to that trend. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, clearly this is, this would open up a whole other realm for your work in any case, but it occurred to me at one point when you're talking about the, you know, having, having that company while you're, um, in that, in those, uh, liminal hours. And the thought that occurred to me was, which is an obvious thing to say at this point, but thinking about how much the pandemic has affected my sleep and the conversations I've had with others around how the, those, all those layers of consciousness are circulating in, in sleep now in a different way than they did in the before time. So that was just the flash that I had around um, the, 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 the shift in consciousness that's occurred and how that's impacted the subconsciousness and unconsciousness um, in, in the, trying to sleep hours yeah so that yeah. occurred to me there yeah absolutely and i feel like if you know part of the yeah. service provided by a sleep podcast is you know uh co-presence and that sort of thing it's especially when isolated during the pandemic that's particularly helpful and also in just to stop thinking about the pandemic and think about something else that's particularly um useful but yeah, thanks for your talk. And also, um, Josh, I really, really, really enjoyed hearing both of your perspectives on this and the way they intersected. Yeah, thanks. Josh, did you want to ask your own question? Uh, I, I did. I, I, I wanted to ask Devin um, about this really um, interesting formulation. Sorry, I can stop raising my hand. Um, 
the psychological noise floor. I thought that was a great formulation and a great take on um, the Mac Haggard uh, concept of around Orphic media. Um, and I just wonder if you would, if you would just maybe say a bit more about about what, how you came to that that formulation, or what what what, uh, just to kind of expand on it a little bit, basically. Yeah. Um, so the psychological no noise floor, to my knowledge, is absolutely not a scientific term. Uh, I, <laughs> if anyone has uh, uh, more resources on that in an official sense, I would love to hear it. Um, but I, I am partially coming at that from um, actually what the Sleep With Me podcast describes as what it's doing um, in that, um, you know, he has this sort of catchphrase of like tossing and turning, mind racing. And so just like the sort of mitigating the, the racing mind while falling asleep is, is a very well-known problem that people have. Um, and by being led along with some sort of very, very loose narrative. Um, it just, it, yeah, it guides, it guides your mind uh, through the sort of noisy chaos of, of, of um, the, per the peripatetic way that the mind goes in many different places. It just sort of limits it to one direction. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, I'm still working on it. <laughs> no, no, but but it, I I, th I think it's like this interesting idea that um, it's kind of using like the, like a podcast like uh, that you describe is kind of using content and using a kind of narrative form to basically raise the raise the noise floor, right? So that so that you you kind of your own your own thoughts are just sort of masked by this kind of. The, the sort of noise of this that's created by the, the podcast. I thought that was a really cool idea. And yeah. I maybe, I maybe like thinking about kind of the narrative aspect and especially you, you had that phrase um, or you, you characterize the, the, the Sleep With Me podcast as filled with sentences that like are not, are never finished. Like mm -hmm. you kind of, won't, there's like these trailing off sentences. Um, so I think that's, that's a great way to kind of think in a, even in a literary way um, about also, how 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 else these the podcast is working? That is, it's both working as a kind of a sonic, um, a, a means of raising that noise floor, kind of uh, sonically, but also um, it's it's working in it. It's it's using a narrative form, or inviting a narrative form, and kind of obscuring it at the same time. So I thought that was really really interesting. Yeah, by ne by never finishing a sentence, it allows you to sort of never let go of the narrative because you're always waiting for the sentence to end, which is mm -hmm. quite effective. Um, yeah. Do we have a do we have a, uh, maybe time for a question? Uh, one question from the audience. If someone has a question, you can raise their hand. Maybe uh, maybe to wrap up then this panel, I'll ask a question to Josh. Um, maybe you 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 have something uh, about this uh, or not. But um, I was interested in your dis your discussion on uh, hallucination and imagination, and I wonder. Um, uh, it seemed to me that the definition or a way of understanding hallucination is that it comes from the outside as opposed to from the inside. Uh, that that will be a distinction between that and what you're generating yourself or what comes from within, as opposed to thinking that it comes from with, from out, out there. Um, so I was wondering, wondering whether that was, um, whether you've, how, how you would kind of consider that uh, inside outsideness in thinking that you're dealing with your own brain. So I was curious about your thoughts. Uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. And, it, and um, I, it occurs to me that I don't, I don't actually, I should have a more like rigorous sense of what 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 a hallucination actually is, um, but but because um, it may it may not be the right word, but I think um, I think what's what's going on here is is a kind of um, there's like a breakdown or a kind of a deconstruction to be made between inside and outside, um, and the 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 weird the weirdness of the hallucination is that it's um, is that it it has this um, uh, it's a kind of uh, maybe like an uncanniness of, of just seeing the kind of mechanism of sensation kind of revealed. Uh, like, 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 you know, Freud sometimes talk in the uncanny essay, he has these, these examples of when the 
I don't want to get into Freud or whatever, but um, where, like the, when you see that the body actually is a mechanical thing um, and, uh, and, and that is somehow revealed that, that there's an uncanniness there. I don't think that this is, the beats are necessarily, they're not uncanny and part of that, but there is something about um, where you kind of are not hearing some sound, you're, you're just kind of hearing, you're hearing, you're hearing, you're hearing how your hearing apparatus works, right? Um, like there's this kind of weird self-monitoring um, and, uh, uh, and, and, this, and kind of circular gesture that um, uh, it, it makes a problem for that in, for inside and outside distinctions. Um, and I mean, hallucination is, is, it's maybe not exactly hallucination, but it's some kind of liminal experience that is not directed out at the world, um, but it's not like an idea or um, a, a, an image in your mind. Um, it's something that's physiological that is kind of tethered to the outside world, but produced internally at the same time. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if that, that gets, that gets to the, to what your question is, but I just think that there's something in, there's something in that kind of outside stimulus inside mechanism, and then a kind of experience that exceeds both of them, um, where, where both sleep and sound, they can be thought together kind of productively. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. I, I will continue mulling that over. Um, so I, we are in a bit over the time for this panel. So we'll, we will take a break now and continue with um, Cedric Kaiser and Sandra Huber, who will be talking about sleep's creative thresholds. We should be starting at 10.30, uh, more or less, the extra couple minutes there, and, and uh, try to keep on time as much as possible. So uh, we'll keep the room open here. So if you want to just stay here or if you want to come back, the same link will apply all day. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for the first panel.